have a muted uh, both of you now so and we are recording so welcome everybody and thank you for joining us for this teacher academy webinar hosted by school education gateway i am eleonora project assistant for school education gateway which is in a, an initiative for, of the european union that brings you examples of innovation practice in european schools this webinar is part of our monthly focus on formative assessment and if Assessment is always a key topic in teaching and learning, perhaps in the current situation where our school education is shifting the line at a distance, is even more crucial to understand why and how teachers should give feedback for evaluation to their students. To talk about this topic today, I have with us uh, Dylan William, Emeritus Professor of Educational Assessment at University College London, who has also kindly accepted to share with us an expert article about formative assessment, which is available on our website. And Javier Ramos Sancha, English and Science teacher in a, prim in a primary and infant school at Lumane San Gregorio in Aguilar de Campo, Spain, and among others, an e twinning ambassador. So before leaving uh, the floor to our speakers, some technical uh, information for you. During the webinar, you can post your comments and questions in the chat box. Also, please note that this webinar session is being recorded and the recording and the slides for the presentation will be available this week on the webinar webpage on the School Education Gateway. So again, thank you very much for, to our speakers for joining us this afternoon. And uh, I hand it over to Professor William. Thank you, Eleonora. So in the time we have available, I'd like to talk to you about why I think formative assessment should be a priority for every school, every college, and every teacher. And it's really very simple. The need for formative assessment comes from two simple ideas, a principle about learning and an uncomfortable fact about the world. The principle about learning comes from the work of David Azubel, who 50 years ago said, if I had to reduce all of educational psychology to just one principle, I would say this. The most important single factor influencing learning is what the learner already knows. Ascertain this and teach accordingly. In other words, we should start our teaching from where our students are, not where we would like them to be. Why is this so hard? Because our students do not learn what we teach. So our guilty secret as teachers is that we teach these wonderful lessons and the students do not learn what we teach. Now, I want to stress that I'm using learning in a very precise sense here. Learning, as defined by psychologists like Paul Kirshner and others, is a change in long-term memory. When people hear that definition, they often object because they think it's more than memorization. It is. But everything that we know how to do, riding a bicycle, recognizing what our children look like, all those things are in memory. And the really important point is, every teacher has had the experience of teaching something to a group of students. They seem to get it, they can do it tomorrow, but two weeks later, it looks like they've forgotten everything. So my argument would be that they have not, uh, they have not learned it. Learning is a change in long-term capability. And therefore, if students aren't able to do it at some point in the future, they haven't really learned it. So if we take that idea, then obviously the fact that somebody could do something now does not mean they can do it in six weeks time, but if they can't do it now, it's highly unlikely they'll be able to do it in six weeks time. So the big idea of formative assessment is the decisions we take in the classrooms should be driven by what sense we are making of what our students are thinking. And it's such an obvious idea, but the trouble is that teachers all over the world do this in a way that doesn't give them what they need. So when I was teaching back in the 1970s, when I first started teaching in London, the decision I made most often every single day was this. Do I need to go over this point one more time or can I move on to the next page? I would make that decision dozens of times every day. How? I would make up a question, ask the students, maybe six of the students would raise their hands. I'd choose one of those students and she'd give me the correct answer and I would say, good, and move on. Now that's not very smart when you think about it, because I'm making a decision about the learning needs of a diverse group of 35 or 40 students based on the responses of one or two confident individuals. I'm pretty sure that if 40 years ago, somebody had asked me, 
is what that one confident student said a good guide to what's happening in the heads of the other 39 students in that classroom? I would have said no. But the point is, nobody did ask me that question. So I did what teachers all over the world still do, which is to make a decision about the learning needs of a diverse group of 30 or 40 students based on the responses of one or two confident volunteers. And that cannot be very smart. So the big idea of formative assessment is that if teachers have better evidence, they'll make better decisions. And if they make better decisions, we'll get better learning. And the really important starting point here is to start with the idea of building plan B into plan A. In other words, we design our lessons with checkpoints. And if the students aren't with us, we'll move on. It's a very simple idea. It's just very hard to do in practice. Now, that's the intuitive case for formative assessment. There's a very strong empirical case now as well. So if you look at the research evidence all over the world on feedback and other aspects of formative assessment, it turns out that no matter which country you're looking at, which age of student, which school subject, when teachers pay attention to this process, students learn more. And if you're interested, this list of research studies here, each of these is a review of research. And between them, these 18 studies draw together about 5,000 different research reports on the effects of feedback and other aspects of formative assessment. So now we have a very coherent picture of the research. When teachers pay attention to this idea, when teachers find get better evidence about what's happening in their students' heads, then students learn more. Now, this idea of formative assessment is interpreted differently by different people. So I've just stressed that I think it's about teachers making decisions minute by minute and day by day in the classroom. In the United States, the term is often associated with the work of Richard DeFore and his colleagues, where the idea is that we would actually give formal formative assessments once every six to 10 weeks. And those things are useful. You know, we need to be finding out whether students are making progress. But the difficulty is that that often arrives too late to do anything with it. But I'm very happy to call that formative assessment. But to clarify the conversation, I think it's useful to distinguish different kinds of, of formative assessment. So I find it quite useful to think about long cycle, medium cycle, and short cycle formative assessment. So the long cycle stuff is characterized by um, across a term or a semester or a teaching unit, typically four weeks to one year length cycle, because then you can monitor student achievement. Are the students learning what they're meant to be learning? And you can also use it to align your curriculum. Are, the, are we teaching the right things to enable our students to progress? It's often also important to share the, the criteria for success with our students. I often ask teachers, if you use a letter grading system like A, B, C, D, F, if a student gets a grade C, do they say, I got a C? Or do they say, she gave me a C? And in many countries, students are much more likely to say, she gave me a C. And that's because the student doesn't really understand the criteria for success. The student thinks that the grade given by the teacher is somehow a judgment about that student's likability or something else completely unrelated to learning. So one of the things that we found very useful is to involve students more in the process. Within and between teaching units, typical cycle length of one to four weeks, resulting in what Richard Stiggins calls student-involved assessment. The idea that assessment should be something that is done with students, not to them. And both of these long cycle and medium cycle formative assessment practices are helpful. But the biggest impact on student achievement comes when it's done within and between lessons, minute by minute and day by day. Because the big idea then is that you actually increase the level of engagement. You're getting information from the students and therefore that makes them more engaged. And the teacher can make their teaching more responsive to the students' needs. So the big idea here is that all three kinds of formative assessment are important, but the biggest impact comes with the short cycle. The reason that's important is because it's actually much harder to change the short cycle stuff because it's involving changing teacher habits rather than the long cycle and the medium cycle, which is involving data. Another way to think about this is in terms of the strategies of formative assessment. So the framework that we found most useful is to think about three processes, where the learner is going, where they are right now, and how to get there. 
and different kinds of people, teachers, peers, and students in the classroom. And that gives us a box of nine cells. And I could discuss each of these nine cells separately, but we find it useful to group some of them together. So the first grouping is clarifying, sharing, and understanding learning intentions. Teachers being clear about what it is they want the students to learn and sometimes sharing those ideas with the students. Now, unfortunately, in many countries, this has led to a practice whereby teachers think they have to tell the students what the learning intention is at the beginning of the lesson. That may be a good idea. It may not. I'm thinking, I'm very clear in my own thinking that it's, the teacher needs to be clear about what the purpose of that activity is, what learning will result. But whether you choose to share that with the students, and if so, at what point, it could be the beginning of the lesson, the middle or the end of the lesson, is a professional judgment by the teacher. So the teacher needs to be clear about this. Whether it's helpful to tell the students about it is a separate decision. So I'm not in favor of a rule that says to every teacher, every single lesson must start with a learning intention. That seems to be a recipe for uninspired and uninspiring teaching. The second strategy we call eliciting evidence of learning. Some people call it questioning, but we use this phrase eliciting evidence of learning to underscore the fact that it's all the ways that teachers can get evidence about student achievement. Sometimes you might ask questions. Sometimes you might make a statement and expect students to respond. Sometimes you must, might just observe how the student is completing a task. So sometimes just noticing is a good way of eliciting evidence of learning. The third strategy we call providing feedback that moves learners forward. Why do we phrase it like that? Well, back in 1998, Paul Black and I wrote a book called Inside the Black Box. And in it, we suggested that feedback was generally more helpful in the form of comments rather than scores or grades. And to their credit, many teachers follow that advice. Unfortunately, a lot of the comments the students were getting were not that helpful. They were along the lines of, this would have been a better piece of work if you had done the following things, but you didn't, so it isn't. The trouble with the word feedback is people look at the last four letters, B-A-C-K, and they think that feedback should be backward looking. Or as Douglas Reeves once pointed out, it's like the difference between getting a medical and a post-mortem. Too many of the feedback comments that students get are more like a post-mortem than a medical. So the big idea here is the main purpose of feedback is to move learning forward. The idea is that feedback helps the students do a better job on some task in the future rather than looking at what went wrong in the past. Or to put it another way, the purpose of feedback is to improve the student, not just to improve the work. The last two strategies underscore the fact that, as Rick Stiggins has said many times, the most important decisions taken in classrooms are not taken by teachers, they're taken by students. So it doesn't matter how good your feedback is, if your students have no desire to learn, you're wasting your time. We have to activate students as learning resources for one another and activate students as owners of their own learning. And in a way, this last strategy is the most important because actually it's where the, all the others lead. The main purpose of feedback is to help the students give themselves better feedback so that they can actually become what psychologists call self-regulating learners. So the big idea here is that students should be owning their own learning, understanding when they're learning, understanding when they're not, and if necessary, making decisions about how to do that better. Another way to think about this is that some people found useful is to think about these strategies of just simply using evidence of achievement to adapt what happens in classrooms to meet learner needs. It's about making classrooms more responsive to student needs. So one way I found it useful in explaining this to teachers is to think about those first, the second and third strategies, eliciting evidence and feedback, as being about responsive teaching. Then the bottom two rows concern the learner's role. And one of the most interesting findings in our work with teachers is you can't change what teachers do in classrooms without changing what students do. So the students have to be involved in this process. But I want to stress that none of this can start until the teacher is clear about what it is they want the students to learn. So before you can even begin, the teacher has to be clear about the learning intentions. Formative assessment does not tell you what to teach. Formative assessment does not tell you how to teach. Formative assessment does not tell you what happens when learning takes place. All it does is 
give you a way of finding out what is happening in students' heads so that you can make smarter decisions about what to do next. Some more recent support for this idea comes from the work of the Educational Endowment Foundation Toolkit, where they looked at different kinds of uh, things we might do to improve achievement, particularly for low achieving students. And they thought to, that a good way of presenting this would be in terms of how much extra learning would you get, how much would it cost, and how good is the evidence. And the top three things they found in terms of cost effect, the biggest impact on student learning for the smallest cost, were three things. Feedback, metacognition, well, that's what psychologists call thinking about thinking, and self-regulated learning, and peer tutoring. In case you're interested, I included the other uh, things they looked at in the slides, but I want to draw your attention to the relationship with formative assessment. What was the first one? Feedback. What was the second one? Metacognition and self-related learning. What was the third one? Peer tutoring. So the three most cost-effective strategies, according to the review conducted by the Education Endowment Foundation, are three of the five strategies of formative assessment. What about the other two? Well, you can't give feedback until you find out what's going wrong. So you have to elicit evidence of learning. And you don't know what evidence to collect until you're clear about the learning intentions. So you have to clarify, share, and understand the learning intentions. So these five strategies seem to be a minimum set of the most powerful strategies for improving student achievement. In other words, if all you care about is improving exam scores, you don't care about creating productive citizens or the quality of learning, if all you want to do is to boost test scores, then these five strategies appear to be the best way to do that. Now, obviously, these strategies are quite uh, vague and can be implemented in many different ways. So one of the things we've done with teachers is to distinguish between strategies and techniques. So when we talk about implementing classroom formative assessment, we take the five strategies and for each of these strategies, we describe to teachers a number of practical techniques. So for example, if you want students to understand what they're meant to be doing, one technique that we found very powerful is to give the students a scoring guide or some, some people call a rubric, and then they give students an anonymous piece of students' work and then say to the students, what feedback would you give this student to help them improve their work? And the reason this is very powerful is because that forces the students to actually look at the rubric in a different way. And it's less emotionally challenging because they're not applying it to their own work, they're applying it to the work of somebody they do not know. And so the sneaky thing about this is that students then come to understand the rubric in the context of somebody else's work and when they've done that, they can then apply it to their own work. The idea of eliciting evidence. One practical technique is what we call an all student response system. So many teachers use many whiteboards. Um, many teachers ask students to um, vote using an electronic voting system. Uh, I actually think those things are probably unnecessary because I quite like the idea of students just answering one a, B, C, D, or E by holding up one, two, three, four, or five fingers. Uh, people who sell the electronic voting system say you can record every single response, but I don't think that's necessarily a positive thing. If we want to create a classroom where students feel okay about making mistakes, I don't think we should be recording every single one of them. So that's why I think in terms of building plan B into plan A, a really good idea when you're planning a lesson is to have a checkpoint in the middle of the lesson where you ask a multiple choice question and again, every student can answer A, B, C, D, or E, and you can make a quick decision about whether to move forward or whether to go back and explain something a second time. The idea is we're making those decisions on the basis of every student response rather than just the confident students who want to share their thinking with us. Um, in terms of feedback, a nice technique that was developed by a teacher called Charlotte Kerrigan in London. She'd been giving comments rather than grades and scores. And, but she was still unhappy with how much attention her students were giving to these comments. So this was a 10th grade class. They'd done a piece of writing on Shakespeare. And she wrote her comments on strips of paper rather than writing on the students' work. 
and then each group of four students received back their four essays and the four comments and their task was match the comments to the essays. And the reason this is so smart is because the teacher has got the students to look at the comments in a different way because now they don't know who's, whose comment is whose. So there's no emotional engagement when they first pick up that comment because they don't know whether it's their comment or not. Uh, students as learning resources for one another. Um, the research on practice testing now shows that it's very beneficial. Just testing yourself, it can be hugely productive for learning. But a way to actually make it even more powerful is students can complete a test under test conditions. But then students meet together in groups of three or four and between them, their task is to come up with the best composite response. So in other words, what's the best test paper we can compare, complete as a group? And finally, as a technique for promoting self-assessment, uh, one thing that students can, be do, can do is to be encouraged to reflect on their practice on the piece of work you've just done, what was easy, what was difficult, and what was interesting about the task. And teachers have told us that when they engage students in this process of um, reflecting on a task, they ask clearer, sharper, and more focused questions. So one teacher said to me, my students used to say things like, I can't do quadratics when there's a... Mi w w w I can't do quadratics. The teacher would say, what's the problem? I ca what can't you do? The, teacher was, the student would say, I can't do any of it. And the teacher said, now they say things like, I can't do quadratics when there's a minus in front of the x squared. So this process of reflection can help students help the teachers more effectively. So we can come up with more of these techniques, but I think what we're also learning is the hardest part is helping teachers use these techniques in their classrooms. And so the model we've developed, we call content then process. First, figure out what you want to help teachers change and then figure out how to change that. So the evidence I've talked about, I've talked a bit about the strategies and techniques. I now want to talk about how to support teachers in making these changes. And we think five things seem to be especially important. The first one is giving teachers choice on what to work on. Every teacher should choose for themselves which aspects of formative assessment will be the most effective in their classroom. Encouraging teachers to adapt these techniques to fit their own classrooms, because what works in one classroom may not work in the same way in a different classroom. Giving teachers permission to change slowly, changing the way you ask questions, giving students more time to answer a question involves changing habits and that can't happen quickly. And the last two parts are basically accountability and support. And we think these are really two sides of the same coin. So we sometimes call this supportive accountability. What is needed from every single teacher, I think, is a commitment to carry on improving their practice, even if they're already good, to be even better, and an agreement to focus on the things that make a difference to students. That's where the research evidence comes in, so that teachers don't waste their time on things that don't help. And what leaders need to do is four things. The first is to create expectations for that continual improvement practice. Every teacher needs to get better, not because they're not good enough, because they can be even better. The leader needs to keep the focus on formative assessment because that's what the research evidence shows has the biggest impact on student achievement. They need to give teachers time to work on this. And in fact, this is the greatest barrier of all. In almost every experiment we've done where we've actually given teachers time to think, they get better. The hardest thing of all is just giving teachers time to think and then supporting risk-taking. And every principal I've ever met says they support risk-taking, but they don't really because they don't want things to go wrong. So if you really want to support a risk-taking culture, I would suggest, as my advice to leaders, is don't praise people for risks that pay off. Praise people for risks when they're taken, not when anybody knows the result. That is the best way to create a risk-taking culture. And the evidence from randomized controlled studies with large numbers of schools, 140 schools in one study, was that when teachers get given time to work on this, the rate of student learning goes up by about 25% at a cost of roughly $2 per student per year. So right now, classroom formative assessment is the single most cost-effective thing that we can think of, that we know of, to raise student achievement. If you want to find out more, there's some resources there, some books there that you can actually look at, and there's also some resources for teachers. 
But the big idea here is giving teachers time to reflect on the evidence they get about the students' pro progress and taking action to do something about that seems to be the most powerful thing we can do to help students make more progress. One teacher said, it's about making the teachers hearing better and about making the students' voices louder. Now, one objection might be, how do we know that this is not just this year's new thing? Well, I don't think it can be because a focus on a formative assessment encourages teachers to look at two things. One, what did I just do with my students? Two, what do they learn? And as long as teachers are reflecting on the relationship between what did I do and what did my students learn, then they will always be able to advance their practice. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, have a good day, Javier. Yes. <clears throat> good, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Eleonora. And, well, um, and thank you, Dylan, because it was really, really interesting what you tell us about uh, formative assessment. Well, the idea on, on my presentation will be to, to talk about formative assessment just on a practical way, is trying to give you examples about how I share the assessment process with my student, okay? Uh, remember, if you want and you want me to uh, ask any question, you have the chat there to, to say any kind of questions. Well, first of all, I want you to talk about my school, okay? My school is um, Colegio San Gregorio. It is in a small village or town in the north of Spain. We have just 700 students from babies to 18 years old. Okay, so that means we have the whole uh, range of students of in, uh, in education before university. We also have a bilingual section. It is said that some subjects are taught uh, through English, like science or arts and craft. Uh, we are called like a Microsoft Showcase School because of the use we, we do it about Microsoft tools. We have a bio program from year five till 18 years old, second of, second of high school. By it means bring your own device. It is said our students have their own device in the school. Uh, we are also an attending school and we have the, the um, budget of 400 and plus uh, of uh, European excellence. There is a website of the school just in case you want to have a look about that. Okay, I'm going to talk to you about assessment in three concrete moments. First of all, the previous assessment, the assessment I do when I start a project or a unit or a topic with my students, then how I assess the assess uh, the daily daily process, okay, how do I assess every day in my class, and then finally, how do I do the, the formative assessment with them, and how did I give feedback. Uh, when I start a project, I used to I used to use sorry uh, thinking routines, okay? Because I need to know two things: what do my students know? What do they already know? And what do they want to learn? Sometimes it's very important not to know because we are set we are set all the time that it's very important to know what my students know about the topic. But also, it's very, very, very important to learn what do they want to learn. Because imagine, I always said the same, the same uh, thing, when I, an example, when I'm talking about that. Imagine um, I am going to do a project about animals with my students and I have to teach them uh, mammals. Maybe, my students want to learn manuals about their favorite animals like the horse or the dog 
if I didn't ask it to them, I didn't know. So maybe I will start talking about mammals using as an example the, um, the cow, which is something very, very boring for them, okay? So um, this is something I used to do it at the beginning, okay? Um, because, and why do it, it through a thinking routine? Because sometimes the problem is the, it's not easy for them to think. Maybe if I just say to them, okay, let me know, what do you know about this topic? They just look at me with my staring eyes and saying, uh, what do I have to say? I don't know. So with these kind of things and structures, I can say them and I can trace to them a way to, to, to think. I'm going to present you um, this as an initial assessment. What is a thinking routine? A uh, thinking routine are basic structures that make our, our students to think in a structured way in a topic. It says, maybe they don't really know how to think about it, so I give them the steps to think on it and to give a very, very, very good structure opinion to the teacher or to the whole class, okay? If we do it before starting a topic or a project, we can get important information about the students' knowledge and interest. Remember, sometimes it's very important what's the pre-knowledge of our students, but also it is very important to know our students' interest on the topic, because on that way we can drive our project easily to them, okay? And uh, also, if I know what's the knowledge of my students and I know what are their interests, I can redesign the project, okay? Sometimes I can re uh, design a topic or a project what I think in my house when I am preparing at my office, that I can think it's the most amazing project or unit or something like this, but sometimes, when I offer this to my students, maybe it's not related with their knowledge and their interest, and it is not good when they are doing so. If I ask in a previous way, I will redesign it and offer it a better idea. Okay, I'm going to offer you a couple of um, I'm going to offer you a couple of examples of thinking routines that can be used in as an initial assessment. And also, if you've already signed these thinking routines, they could be also a powerful tool to, to use it along the whole topic or, or project. Um, first one is KWL. Okay, KWL is a thinking routine that can uh, help us with the assessment about, along the whole project, yeah, uh, from the beginning to every day. Okay, first of all, with a K, what did I know about the project? We can about the topic, sorry. We can use this at the beginning of the project. We can create a very big template of this in the class and give the students some post-its or pieces of paper so they can write there what do they know about animals, machines, whatever it was. Okay? Um, then at the same moment, we are going to ask them, okay, very good, this is what you already know about that. Now, what do you want to learn? Okay, so I am assessing their interestings. Uh, and they can say to me how ca I can drive my project to make it more effective and more near to their interests. Okay, also, I can use this every day because at the next day when I go to my class and I start again the project or the task, I can say, okay, very good. Let's review what do, did you want to learn yesterday. And now let's check if we have already known and learned about that. So I can change the posit from the W to the K. And also I can add more things on W for next days, okay? And at the end of the project, I will go to L, what did I, or what have I learned along this project, okay? And there, 
my students will say to me what they have already learned about that. And I can check, not with a test, not with a composition, not with something really formal, their learnings. Sometimes they learn, uh, they learn lots of things which are not very formal and they can show to me their Okay, another one. This is something I found in the internet, the picture, and I redesigned it to convert and create it there uh, uh, a thinking routine. It's like like I will I call the triple chocolate cake to a chef. Okay, with the following graphic organizer, the picture that you have there, maybe the letters are very small, but I'm going to explain you. Um, you can assess also the beginning, okay, and also you can uh, assess along the project as I have explained to you in the KWL um, picture uh, thinking routine, okay. So um, there at the base of the ball, students. Also, we can create a template of this in our in our class. Um, at the base, I will write the topic. Okay, the topic animals. Then on the bowl, I um, I will just think on the base my students have on this topic. It says I will just write down there with my students what do they already uh, what do they know about the topic? Okay, they previous learn uh, the previous knowledge. Sorry, or the um, or their interests okay that's great then if I go to the brown chocolate brown chocolate is not real chocolate because it has got chocolate and milk okay so something that I can doubt there every day my students at the end of the lesson uh, can paste or stick or write down the doubts they have at the end of the lesson so I can take it there at the very beginning of the lesson, next day, and solve the doubts with them. Okay, white chocolate. White chocolate is not real chocolate. Okay, it's something different than chocolate. So there, students can stick uh, the post-its and the things um, with the things that surprise about um, the topic, the the project, the things that we are doing on this project so there i can check and talk with them what it is surprising to them and finally black chocolate black chocolate is real chocolate the the the, the good one so there the students will stick the things that they are learning along the project we can do black chocolate at the end of the project to assess everything or we can do it on a daily basis so I can check what they are learning. Uh, there you have three links that you can check uh, about thinking routines. Here is thinking routines um, were created and or, and or were studied a lot by Project Zero of Harvard University. There you can find lots of information, theoretical one and lots of practical things. This uh, link about Alice Vigo is a really nice teacher who has lots of things there. And here is um, the website of our bilingual section of our, of our school. That you can have this and other ones that we have already translated into English to be used. Um, Okay, checking the process. So we have assessed at the beginning, and now we are going to check the process. Um, it is very important, especially when we are using team-based learning, or when we are using project-based learning, or when we are using any kind of learning where the student is the center of the, of the learning, it is very important to check on a daily basis what our students are doing or learning. Really important is not to miss any one of them. 
Okay. Sometimes, if I check on a regular basis, daily base, uh, I will check and I will know what are the doubts and problems on that meeting, not at the end of the project, nor when I give the final assessment. And also, something which is very important, because it's one of our key competencies, is uh, learn how to learn, okay? Um, how they are learning and solving their own problems. Very good. To assess this on the process and on a regular basis, I have this, uh, the learning diary. Okay? The learning diary is the best way of practice, of the, is the best way I can practice my daily assessment. Okay? Um, the students develop um, the key skill of learn to learn and, and I can check easily. How do I do? Uh, I have uh, these questions shared with them. I can do that in different ways. It says I can have um, I can have a shared notebook that is in the middle of the group. Uh, I can have a shared document via Google Drive or OneDrive or Word. Or uh, in my case, I use OneNote. Uh, so in the collaboration space of the OneNote, students go there through their own groups and they have these four questions, uh, these five questions, okay? I will just explain to you how, how they are like this. First of all, they have to write the date, okay? Yeah, so because it's a diary, so if it is a diary, they need to organize their learning on a regular basis day. Then I will ask who is taking the role, the different roles I have in the class. Okay? Why? Because if the problems are related with the responsibilities of each one of the roles, I'm not going to talk with the whole group. I will try to help each role. Okay? So then the aim, okay, what's the aim of the day, okay, what do they have to do or learn today, what they have to, what they do, okay, it is very important because when they are working in groups on the same projects and you have a lesson of 50 minutes, it's very difficult to sit down and work with the whole group all the time, so because it is very difficult that I need to know what they have done at the end of the lesson, okay? What they have they learned and what problems do they have? At the same time, I am asking how did they solve so I can know if they are solved it or not. What happens with the document? At the end of the day, I can check it, everything. And next day, I start from here, okay? I start from here talking with the groups, going back in something that maybe that it should be better explain or something like that. Okay, as I said to you, you can use a notebook, which is always in the school and teacher can check it, or you can use using the ICT with Word, Document, OneNote, Google Drive. Okay, assessment uh, equals reflection. When I arrive at the end of a project, I did this kind of assessment, okay? I've never assessed just with a final mark and on my own. I, uh, everything we did in my class, we assess it from three different points of view. First of all, the teacher's assessment. I offered them a, a, a rubric. So in this is I when I offer my point of view of the final product or knowledge, what do did my students learn from my point of view, from the point of view of the person who knows what was the maximum I really want them to get? Self-assessment, um, in which each student offer their point of view of their knowledge. Okay, how did I learn? And what did I learn in my final product? Okay. And finally, because I always work in, in groups, uh, I need to offer them the opportunity of assess not other one's product, 
or other ones learning no? uh, about how did they learn together, how did they work as a group, and most of all, how can they improve, okay? I'm going to show you quickly how did I do, because I have uh, instruments to do it everything. First of all, the teacher's assessment. I offer this kind of fabric. I always do it in mother tongue, because I think if I offer them uh, the opportunity in mother tongue, uh, when I am assessing, is better than doing in English, despite my subject arts in English. Because if not, I will miss lots of information, which are which is really, really important to me, okay? We always offer um, them at the beginning of the project. So when I started the project or a topic, I'm saying to my students, okay, this is what you need to do, what you need to learn. Then self-assessment, this is the instrument I use it to, um, I use it to do with my final, to assess the, um, where my students assess themselves, sorry. Um, at the end of the project or topic, I have an assessment lesson. It's an assessment uh, lesson in where we only assess. Students assess themselves, they are, um, sorry, this is wrong. I have to, it's not peer's assessment target. The self-assessment target is then using the rubric. It says a student has in front of him the rubric and the uh, things that are around the target are the same topics that are in the rubric. Okay, so the student have a look and decide, okay, I get here or I get there. And, and in the back part of this document, which is the second part, they have to offer me the points and why do they give themselves these points and how they can improve that point, okay? Um, this is how is a final assessment uh, self-assessment target done, okay? Students do that. If the color part is bigger, is because the, they think their work is better. If it is smaller, it's because they, they do it uh, wrong. And this is the Pierce assessment, okay? Pierce assessment, here you have four parts, okay? Because normally my groups are made of four people. So, they have to write their own name here, and they have to give them points. How do I do that? Okay, uh, I am uh, as a teacher. I only walk around the class, listening what's taking place on each group, but I've never said nothing about that. Uh, so they have to talk about these points, and they can give four points of each topic to each student. So three students talk about one and offer and giving them opinions and points. At the end, this first one say, okay, I'm, I'm agree, I uh, think I have to improve that and things like this. So they sign the final, this document, okay? And in the back part, they write to me the different, the different things they talk about to justify the, the the marking, okay? If there are no four signatures here, it's because someone is not really agree with their the discussion. So this is when the teacher sit down with them and try to talk and moderate the the discussion and get an agreement to, to everybody. Okay, one of the things that uh, they asked me is to say, because we are suffering this kind of remote learning time, and I'm just paste here three slides to take, talk to you about how we are doing now in the school with remote learning, just in case it's useful for you. Uh, well, we use Microsoft Teams. Here in Microsoft Teams, we have the opportunity of sending assignments to them, give a daily feedback to them, and we can set the rubrics here, exchange folders, and communicate. We have um, live online sessions every day with the students here. 
Uh, how do I assess them? Okay, is using OneNote. I have three options here. Quaderno Seva. I give them the topics and the contents. Then here in collaboration space is the place in where students can work together and assess and talk to the, each other and create final products together. Then I have. Um, their personal notebooks, okay? Students have their personal notebooks in where they give me the answers or the things I'm asking in the assignment. And then we use uh, forms by these kind of questionnaires. They are not only giving them um, just questions. We try to work on skills more than on contents. And also we use Flipgrid in where we can share videos and also not only saving videos uh, I can check what my students are doing because they are not giving an answer to me they are explaining to me that answer through a video and I can give it back them recording a video also uh, sorry I forgot something here it's just going to be a second because maybe you make uh, it's you can review the presentation later and you can contact me through Twitter if you want and ask me more questions after that. But the final mark of my students, because at the end uh, here in Spain we have to offer them a final mark in the report, it's that 60% is created by the teacher assessment, 20% is created by the self assessment, and uh, another 20% is created by the peers assessment, okay? Peers assessment and self assessment. Uh, sorry, I will go to the end just to find um, to 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 finish. Assessment is the engine we drive students learning. If we don't use the assessment to create the process of our uh, students learning, it's not going to be uh, the right way. So thank you so much. You can contact me through Twitter if you want. And it was a pleasure to be here, yes, with so many people listening about our experience at Colegio San Gregorio. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Javier. And I think that, uh, yeah, we still have time for uh questions and I, I just wanted to really thank everybody it's incredible to see how many people have joined us and decided to join us uh, this afternoon and uh, it was great to see the interaction between participants and um, I, I really would like to uh, leave space for specific questions if any or if perhaps um, Dylan, you, you would like to add something um, to the second part of the presentations? Ah, there's so no, many no. comments right now, it's incredible. Yes. Dylan. Yes. Thought that what I thought what, what Javier did was to do a nice example of a couple of the things that I talked about. So he's talking about activating students as owners of their own learning. He's talking about activating students as learning resources for one another. And he's brought in the feedback as well as the eliciting evidence. So I think that was a very nice um, w example of a way to integrate all these strategies into a single activity. Um, yes. Thank you, Dyla. <laughs> Uh, I picked a question that perhaps is summing up uh, some other question that uh, our participants might have. And uh, the question is, do you have any recommendation or strategy about formative assessment for online teaching and more specifically about formative assessment of uh, pra practical workshops in uh, vocational training? Well, I think the important thing to remember is that the principles of learning are the same in online and in face-to-face -face settings. So 
um, formative assessment is even more important in uh, online settings because you can't rely on seeing your students. You can't rely on that kind of interaction that you get in a face-to-face -face setting. So I think this idea of building plan B into plan A, uh, when you do a piece of explanation of something uh, to your students online, then you could use a multiple choice question to check they've understood it. There's also, I think, a different kind of usage, which is if you by using a flipped model. So for example, you might tell your students to go and work through chapter three of a textbook, for example, and say that when they come to, when the, when the group comes together the next day, that you're going to ask them a question about this. So you might begin the session with a question, with a key um, question about what they've been studying. Now there are two benefits here. The first is that it gives the teacher some idea of whether the students have understood the things they were meant to be reading. But it also tells the students, you better do the reading. Because if they know that the teacher is going to ask them a question at the very beginning of the next session, they're much more likely to do the reading because they don't get the answer wrong. So I think just formally building in opportunities to collect evidence and make decisions about what to do next, I think is even more impo important in online learning than it is in face-to-face -face teaching. Dylan, perhaps another question uh, for you, but also, of course, for, of course, for uh, Javier. And uh, one participant is asking, how should teachers deal with the pressure to give summative assessment in combination with the need of formative assessment? Well, I would say that summative and formative are not different kinds of assessment. I think the words summative and formative are most usefully used to describe the conclusions we draw. So if I give students a test and I grade the test and I give a student a score of 75%, that's a summative conclusion. The student has mastered 75% of the content of this test. But if I can look at their test responses and I see that this student is having a particular difficulty with a scientific concept such as the gas laws, that gives me something to work with. So any assessment produces evidence, and that evidence can be used formatively or summatively. So I think the, the really important thing is to get into the habit of, of trying to use the same information, both for formative and for summative purposes. Um. Javier, uh, somebody was asking uh, whether students are involved in creating the rubric. Uh, well, mm, I think it's a really, really great point to do it. But the problem now is that uh, when I'm talking to you about all of this, I'm talking about my year five students. In most of the cases, it is the first time they work through projects and they work uh, with this kind of assessment. So I think it's not really easy to them to understand how, how they are implied. What I used to do it is maybe if they want to add any kind of topics to the, one, uh, the rubric I gave to them, they can add and we can talk and share it in the assembly. We have democratic assemblies, so they can offer me ideas about how can I improve the rubric. But the, the giving one, the one I gave to them is the one I did it. Maybe we can improve it, but uh, it is very difficult on that point because it is the first time they start working like this. Maybe two or three years later when they are really used to these kind of things, they could be a really, really, really great because... point. Some teachers use this process they call co-construction, where the teacher constructs the rubric with the students. But I think that's fine if it works well, but it's dangerous because the students do not know enough about the subject to know what good work looks like. So I think the idea of giving students some say in how you develop the rubric can be valuable, but the teacher has to be in charge of the process. So what I suggest is that the teacher shares some examples of work from students from previous years anonymously, 
and then asks the students, are some of these pieces of work better than other pieces of work? And the students come up with ideas about which is the best piece of work, which is the not so good piece of work. And then they, the teacher says, so what can we say about these pieces of work that are better? And so that the teacher can then draw out from the students some ideas. But the important point is the teacher is still in charge. The teacher is still making sure that whatever the rubric looks like is something that is um, that matches the sense of quality about work that the teacher has. The teacher is an expert, the students are not experts, and therefore they can't be in the role of deciding what makes a good piece of writing, what makes a good piece of science, what makes a good piece of mathematics. They don't know enough to make that judgment. I think that you just uh, answered to most of the questions we are receiving, of course. Um, um, the, uh, it's impossible to tackle all the questions and uh, cover completely this topic in just one hour. So um, I would like again to uh, thank our, our speakers. For joining us to for joining us this afternoon, and uh, now I would like to uh, remember everyone that we would truly appreciate if you could uh, fill in our feedback survey. And at the end of the feedback survey, you will find the link to download um, the certificate. Uh, of participation. I will leave the slide on for the next 24 hours. If you have uh, any issue of uh, technical nature, you can uh, get in touch with the uh, Atlas of School Education Gateway. I would like to remind you that we will share the recording of this uh, um, presentation and uh, the slides uh, will be available on the School Education Gateway this week. Um, um, if, uh, Javier, you would you like to add something? Uh, well, no, just um, well, maybe I think it's lots, lots of lots of information. The thing that we have given to them just in in a few in a few time. So if just they can contact uh, at least me whenever they want and ask me and I can give another kind of examples of things like this and just thank you so much and uh, for all the attention and to, to look about the small experience I have in this kind of uh, small school in, in the north of Spain. Thank you very much, Javier. And uh, I will I will share the yes the link to the survey for our participants. Uh, this webinar was also part of an uh, online course, and you can find more information on Teacher Academy uh, webpage. So once again, thank you very much, Julian. Thank you very much, Javier. And see you the next uh, Teacher Academy webinar. You're welcome. Right. Thanks a lot.